And so what we, what we talk about and help you to understand is how to use the power of the sled to your advantage. If you're pulling on the handlebar, you're doing it wrong. You should never have to pull on the handlebars to get the sled up on its edge. It's all about uh, uh, technique and balance. And when you learn that technique, and, keep the, and when you're able to keep that sled up balanced on its edge, you can do some pretty amazing things in the backcountry. And you'll find that you can get in and out of uh, highly technical terrain uh, without an incident. And, uh, but what you do find is, is that you start looking for more challenging terrain so that uh, you can keep sharp. And I thought about uh, quite a few different uh, theories of why left is easier than right. Um, and what it comes down to probably is if you're right-handed, it's easier for you to go left. It's just like being goofy foot on a snowboard. Are you a snowboarder? Do you prefer one way or the other? Yeah. And uh, so the difference is, and so how do you get good on the right side? It's a mirror image. So when you're going left, when you're on your left side, you're, you have the sled balanced on its edge, you're traversing a hillside. Pay attention mentally to what your, where your body position is. Where are your feet? What are you doing with your shoulders? Where are you looking? It's a big thing. And it's a mirror image on the other side. It's simple as that. It's a mirror image. You uh, turn around and practice going the other way. And uh, it, sh it shouldn't be too difficult if you pay attention to that. Build more confidence. So that's a great question. And uh, you, if you don't have confidence uh, in your writing skill set, then you cannot, uh, you'll never be able to really uh, get your snowmobile through the backcountry the way you want to. And in order to, to have confidence in yourself, you have to have confidence in your snowmobile. You have to be able to trust your snowmobile. And as I uh, told this young man earlier, uh, you how do you get confidence, gain confidence in your sled? You ride it. The more seat time, the more confidence you'll have. When, when you learn uh, what, what your sled's going to do when it hits a bump, then you can set up for that and you can prepare to react to what the sled does. And it's all about seat time. The more, the more time you can spend riding the sled, the more confidence you'll build. Thanks for that question. So, um, I had a group, if I remember right, they were from Iceland. Yeah, they were from Iceland. And uh, we had them out west here somewhere and you have to understand, has anybody ever been to Iceland? Is there any trees? Did you see any trees in Iceland? No, there are no trees in Iceland. And they were so preoccupied with the trees here that they were focused solely on the trees. Um, and they could, not, they could not ride through the trees without ending up in a tree well. Or you can even start into the trees and like all 10 of them were each in, each one in a tree well. And uh, throughout the course of the day, some of them improved and got better and got better. But we were having a discussion over dinner that night. And, uh, and I was trying to explain to them that you need to be focused on your line, uh, your choice of your path through the trees and focus only on that path and not on the trees. And uh, the one guy s spoke up and he, com he made the comment, he said, I got it now. He said, you can't see the trees. And that's so much the case. I, 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 I physically know that there's an obstacle there that I don't want to run into. But as soon as you start looking at a tree and focusing on it, you're going to end up in that tree well. And I only focus on my path through the trees and beyond. And that's 
the reality is that's how you have to do it. Um, and it's really difficult. Um, less advanced riders are slower because they're maybe, maybe I can use the word timid, and they're, uh, they focus on the path immediately in front of their sled. They can't, they don't look out, and because of that, it forces them to go slow. And when you go too slow, then it's easier to get stuck. You don't have the momentum to power through a difficult area, and there's there's lots of things that that happen. But when you're focusing on the terrain uh, immediately in front of your sled, you're going to be slower, and, and you're not. You can't see the path out in front, and you're you pay attention to all the obstacles, the stumps, and the rocks, and the trees, and and everything else that's that's out there. When you focus on those hazards, uh, they'll eat you up. And you need to learn to look out. It's kind of hard to look beyond the hazards, but you need to force yourself to look ahead. Look way out where you want to go, and you will go there. Good luck with that. Don't worry about bending the bumper here and there. My front shocks meaning ski shocks, where are you? Ski shops, is that what you're talking about? So, I'm going to elaborate on this to a degree. Uh, if you want to hear all about suspensions, come back at four o'clock, I think it is, 4.15, and we're gonna talk all about suspensions, everything you wanna know about suspensions. Um, but the question is, do I adjust my ski shocks for conditions if it's set up properly, if it's my suspension, which this is what displays, I do not ever have to touch them. They're, they're properly set up. And this, this suspension, as you see on the snowmobile, is calibrated with uh, such that when the sled is on its edge, one ski is supporting the sled and my shock spring combination is strong enough to support the weight of the sled by itself. I don't need two uh, shocks to support the weight of the sleds. The factory calibrates the suspension using two sleds to support the weight of the sled. I do it differently because I spend more time on one ski than I do on two. And. Um, uh, but yet it works when I'm two skis down just fine, and I can elaborate on that in detail later this afternoon. But uh, if, your, if your suspension's set and uh, calibrated properly, you should never have to adjust it. Okay? I just had a question. You said I'm not going to calibrate two slides into two skis. Yeah, okay. I, I made an answer in the wrong word. So the question is... Uh, uh, the fact does the factory calibrate the sled uh, with two skis on the snow? So yes, two skis on the snow. It takes two shocks and springs to hold the weight of the sled up. And it, with that in mind, when I bring my sled to its edge, so I'm only uh, supporting the sled with one ski. There's not enough strength. There's not enough spring capacity to hold the weight of the sled up. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay, so you're talking about riding uh, on with your body on one riding board. Okay, and we go through the positions uh, when we do our classes, and there's a video, it's one of the early videos. Do you remember which John uh, video it is that talks about rider position? So the first video is rider position. Number one, first video. And uh, if you've seen that, by chance, so get on our YouTube channel, all right? And uh, Ryder Rasmussen style YouTube channel. And it goes through this in great detail. But there's actually four rider positions. We call them neutral, position one, position two, and position three. And I'm holding four fingers up, so it's gonna <laughs> bother me. But position three is, we also refer to that as wrong foot forward. And uh, some riders uh, stand with their left foot and their left running board and stick the other one out. That's wrong. It's bad form. And 
So wrong foot forward means you have your right foot and your left running board and you reach out with your free leg. And it's, uh, it's pretty easy to feel comfortable with this if you um, practice it to some degree. And uh, it's all about balance. It's really all about balance. And, and when, you're, when you're standing in this position, you'll find uh, the balance point of your sled and, and then you're able to use the steering to kind of manage that balance like a bicycle. Okay, does that help? Ah, okay, transitioning from uh, two wrong foot forward from another position. So um, there's, there's, who, who had the question? Okay, the guy with the prize, with the socks. So maybe you wrong foot forward uh, on the right side and you need to be on the other side. Just hop over the sled, right? Uh, I do it, but I'm holding the mic. I need two hands. Um, what's that again? Oh, yeah, I've missed the board before, but that's all part of the game, right? I pretty much know where it is. Um, but yeah, so you can you can hop over the seat, and if, with enough practice, you know where the board is. You can you should be able to land on it. But there's and maybe it does take a little practice to uh, to, to figure that out. But I mean, you can go from wrong foot forward right to wrong foot forward left in like a split second, and uh, it's fairly easy to do. Uh, the slow way is to go from neutral position one by twisting my heel out on the running board, and then position two like this, so I have two feet on the running board. And then at this point, all you have to do is extend your front foot and your wrong foot forward, just like that. So Kino being is how he went over the seat. A lot of people try to step and go over the seat. The key is to take your foot around the seat, not over the seat. And get a low seat. Like this is this is the uh, studio expert. And who may, who has an expert coming this year? A few. You're gonna love that slide. It's so awesome. Uh, the expert seat is. An uh, inch and a half lower than the standard summit, maybe more, something like that, anyway. And it's surprising how much easier it is to get over the seat. Even if you're taller, you can get over the seat so much easier. Uh, actually is a good sponsor of Ride Rasmussen style, and they build a seat that's another inch and a half lower than this. And it's amazing how much easier it is to uh, uh, transfer across the seat with that lower. So if you go over, um, you have to pick up, your foot gets in the way, but if you, if you just run your leg around the back, there's more room. Less energy, you don't have to pick your leg up as far. Like, again, it's dependent on how high your seat is. So if you have a stock rise seat, then you definitely have to go around the back. But if you're a tall guy with a low rise seat, then it might be just as easy to, to come over. But I'll, I'll generally trip up on the seat if I try to come over it. So the question is, when you're wrong foot forward, how do you get back to neutral um, quickly and with control? Correct. And the, the first thing is I'm going to point out that there's an anticipation thing that you all need to be considering because if you wait, if you wait until you need to transfer, you're behind the sled, you, it's not going to work out for you. It's not, it's just, you're, it's going to cause a wreck, okay? And so it's about anticipation. And I said earlier, look way ahead, look forward, look at your path. And when you look forward, you can uh, figure out a plan. If you have a plan, you'll, you will succeed. If you don't have a plan, you you will wreck. You're, it's not gonna work out for you. It's all about having a plan and following through. And so to uh, Matt's question, if you're going to succeed by transferring from any position back to neutral, you have to have thought about it before it's time. Uh, anticipate. And uh, I think about this in my mind as I'm going through the terrain. I can, I can physically, in my mind, see what I'm doing with my body before that happens. 
and then when it's time, it, it's automatic. It just comes. But the question is, what if you're in wrong foot forward or writing position, where do you put your foot? Great question. You can put the foot anywhere from all the way forward to all the way rearward. Okay? It all works, but it works differently. And so generally you're going to start perhaps mid running forward, but it depends on your plan. You've, you've uh, recognized your path and you evaluate where you want to go. Are you, do you want to continue a traverse, you know, relatively horizontal across the hill? Then you're going to be about mid running board. Okay? If you're, if you want to turn up slightly, then you're going to step back on your running board a few inches. If you're on the balance point, you can move your foot a couple inches and you'll feel what happens to the sled. The sled will change uh, its attitude when you're on the uh, balance point. And so if you move a few inches, the sled will start to go uphill. If you move back a few more inches, the sled will start to go uphill more aggressively. If you move back a few more inches, it'll turn right around and go the other way. And it'll happen so fast that you'll probably end up going downhill because you didn't touch it in time. Uh, if you want to go downhill, you're in the traverse, horizontal across the hill, uh, you slide your wrong foot all the way to the foot stirrup and push your body forward and the sled will start to go downhill just like that. So my foot is generally going to be at a 45 degree angle. Can you see that? With my heel hanging off the edge, my heel always off the edge of the running bar because it puts me further away from the center point of the sled. Okay? And it gives me more a leverage advantage over the sled. Often I see riders standing like this. Okay, this puts them at a huge disadvantage. That really, and not only that, but, but when you're standing like this, your hips are pointed forward and your body's twisted. So you need to be 45 degrees, something like that. Um, even closer to 90 is not bad, but your heel off the edge and then your shoulders are in line with the handlebars and uh, you can see both ways, okay? You've got good vision, good control. Good question. Where is the change in the expert spindle? So uh, those of you who are my experts uh, uh, have been told that there's a spindle upgrade and it's really a subtle change, but it's a big improvement and it's very noticeable. Um, it's not very noticeable to see, but I'm going to, maybe I'll just have Aaron step up here and, and tip the sled up for me. Stand on that side and pull the, hopefully there's enough room here. I just need to ski up and down. So, uh, if you look at the attitude of the sled, the ski, when the, when the ski's off the ground, it's, it's pretty flat, level. Um, I can pull the tail up a little bit, and the front of the ski goes down pretty sharply, um, but it doesn't want to come up. Uh, it's, it, it's locked down. Uh, with that, you might have done. With that, if you compare that to uh, regular summits, you'll find that the ski will rotate clear up before it stops and it will not go down like this one does. And, and what that does for you, it does a couple of things. Um, you've all been traversing a hillside when you tag something with the ski and it tipped up and stops you. The back of the sled switches around you and you don't know what happened, but effectively, the ski tipped up and stopped, and uh, the sled whipped around because of momentum. And uh, this happens on all brands, actually. Uh, Morris has had some issues. The old XMs were really bad. They improved that on the G4 chassis, and now with the Xperia, it's 
it, it's really, it's, it's practically gone away. You don't get the feedback through the middle bars anymore when you're, when you're going through uh, really rough light, um, ripply snow like we get in the springtime. Uh, the other, the second thing that it does, uh, and you can see the benefit of this as I explained it, when you're traversing a hillside and you're counter steering to uh, maintain your balance, the ski tail will be in the, in the snow on the uphill side of the uh, sled and it's pushing down and because that ski tail is pushing down it's trying to tip your sled back down to two skis. And so now because of the attitude of the ski, the ski tip wants to naturally go down so the ski tail isn't pushing against the hill and it's easier to keep up its edge because of that. It's kind of a long answer, but it's, it's really uh, very effective and very noticeable when you get on one. So the, the question is, do I, am, do I disconnect my sway bar um, and would it help on a factory suspension if I did? So if you look closely at this slide, you see that I've removed my sway bar completely. I don't have it on, uh, but that's because I have enough spring capacity to keep the sled level in the turns and I don't need a sway bar. A sway bar on this package would actually um, create some other issues. On the factory suspension, because the calibration is performed uh, with two skis carrying and sharing the load of the sled, uh, you very much need a sway bar. And if you disconnect the sway bar, Skidoo actually offers a quick disconnect um, uh, accessory that you can put on it and makes it easy to connect and disconnect. Uh, so then you could experiment with it if you wanted to, but as soon as you disconnect it, it gets really mushy. And when you step on the running board, the this, this shock will squash clear down. You can see I get a little squash with this, but if you disconnect the sway bar with the stock suspension package, it squishes way down and then finally the other sled comes, the other ski comes up. Uh, on this sled, you'll see that as I, as, I, as I put weight on it, it squashes a little bit, but it holds, and the other ski comes up. It holds firm, and the other ski comes up. So it doesn't squash, it doesn't give me that squashy feeling. And with this, what I get is a good feel for the train. I know how my sled's sitting on the heel in the snow. Uh, and, I, and I don't get that squashy feel. So it's good to disconnect your sway bar only if you have the spring calibration to allow that. So back to the uh, sway bar question. Uh, I do not recommend to disconnect the sway bar with the factory suspension because it's too mushy. It won't support the weight of the sled. That all fall there. Yeah. I mean, you can play with it. The, the problem is, is, so your sway bar hooks pull springs together in it because the left spring isn't strong enough by itself. It, it, it reaches over to the right spring for some help. That's what the sway bar does. Can I do that with, with adding more preload? Preload doesn't change spring rate. Okay, so you've got to go to a different spring rate to get to, to the point of it. Right, the question was, what can I do to my sled to make it so I can keep up to my dad and my brother? Take writing lessons. So you're not in the audience. Who is this question? So uh, it's all about balance. So and it's about your sled to, to a big degree. So I don't. He's not here, so I can't ask him what a sled is. But uh, some sleds are easier to balance than others. Some sleds have very wide balance points and have a very narrow balance point. Um, the one thing that I'll just say quickly is that if you have a uh, short gear limiter strap to keep the front end of the sled down from climbing, it will drastically hurt you when uh, trying to maintain a balance going uh, side of the maneuver. And so what it does effectively is it takes your balance point from wide to very narrow. Okay, when, uh, Aaron, can you pull this sled up on its edge again? Yes. 
Go ahead and split on this edge uh, and step on the running board, put some weight on the running board. See how it kind of pushes the front of the table might be in the way, but when he pushes on the running board, because he's going to be riding the sled as he's going across the hillside, uh, what it does is it pushes the track and makes contact with the snow at the front. Okay, this sled's been set up so the limiter strap is loose, okay, all the way out. So my, my suspension is uh, falling all the way out. And when he, sit, when he puts pressure on the running board, the rear of the suspension will collapse a little bit until the front takes hold. And you've got, so you've got a contact point on your ski, you've got a contact point here in the mid sled, and you've got a contact point at the end. As soon as, and so that gives you a wide balance point. As soon as you pull your lumbar straps together, and most people don't think about this, but when you shorten your lumbar strap, you're, you're, you're taking uh, uh, suspension travel away, and so your track will not fall out as far. And there's, there's no contact point in the middle anymore. The contact point now is ski and rear axle, and it won't stay on its edge. Makes a very hard balance. Now, the question is, how do you use your throttle and brake to get the sled on its edge? Is that correct? Throttle and brake action to get the sled on its edge. So uh, I, I keep repeating myself in that if you're pulling on the handlebars, you're doing it wrong. So every time I ask Aaron to come up here and tip the sled on its edge, what's he doing? He's pulling on the handlebars. Why is it? Because the engine's not running, he doesn't have advantage of gravity, he can't use the horsepower, he, he, he's restricted only to human power. And he has no choice because I won't let him start the sled. Okay, I'm only going to be in trouble. So, if you're on a flat surface, or let's, let's go a different scenario. See, your sled is leaning downhill and you need to get it pulled back up. So there's an easy way and a hard way. It depends on if there's room to do it the easy way. The easy way to, get, to find your edge is to turn downhill until you're going downhill and slightly the opposite direction until the force of gravity will hand your sled to you. It just tips you up. And then you catch the sled and on its balance point, and you drive back to the direction that you were originally going. There's no effort required. It comes up, uh, it, I mean, you have to make a, like an S turn to, to get it up, and there's absolutely no effort. The conventional method is to grab a hold of the uh, mountain strap, which I don't even have. Did anybody recognize no mountain strap? And so, let go of your handlebar grip, grab hold of the mountain strap, and reef it over, and that costs a lot of energy, it wears you out, and uh, and that's the wrong way. Uh, and so, if perhaps there's not room to turn down to the S curve, curve and, and, and get the sled on its edge. Uh, there's an alternate method, it takes a little bit of human power, but you're not physically pulling the whole sled. And if you do it right in a, in a certain condition, uh, it takes relatively small energy. And so you'll be, I'll move around the sled, you'll be in a counter steer position, you'll start your wrong foot forward, okay? Wrong foot forward, and then you do a blast of throttle. Uh, but at the same time, I hang my finger over the brake lever. And if you've noticed, I have a, uh, an adjustable brake lever. This is available through skins. And uh, with this lever, I can bring it closer to my handlebar so that it's easier to reach. I can operate it with just one finger, where the uh, factory lever would go way further ways away. Especially if you have small hands, it's hard to reach that lever. Um, and maybe impossible with only one finger with any control. And so I have one finger on the brake lever, I'm wrong foot forward, and counter steer, and I'm ready to make my maneuver. And so skis are, are turned down, and this might be pretty hard to commit to because there's a cliff here or something, and it's death. 
and I've got to be successful or I'm going to die. And so, uh, what a lot of what a lot of guys will do is get their buddies to come over or physically get the slide up and hand it to them. And uh, but you don't need to do that. So it's a blast to throttle. And when I say a blast, it's not just a feather. It's a blast all the way to the bar. It spins the track. It gets the machine in motion. Okay, but your skis are turned down, and the sled wants to go straight because the track is driving you straight. So, because the skis are turned down and the track is pushing you forward, the sled will land right in your lap and will come right over to you. Because you're using a blasted throttle, okay, you get, you're building a quite a bit of track speed. This is an 850, and it will build a lot of track speed and nothing flat. Okay, and so as soon as the sled gets to its edge, when it comes to the balance point, you've got to catch it there and maintain control. Well, if you don't get a hold of the brake, you're going to be going 100 miles an hour through the timber, and that's probably going to not end up good. So catch your speed with the brake, and the, the brake action will actually force the sled into the heel by itself. But the key here is to find your balance point and control your speed. Slow is fast. Makes it easy. So the question is, I'm 6'5 and short handlebars don't work for me. So everything's relative, right? So it's relative, your handlebar height is relative to your height, but also relative to your skill set. And I'm going to tell you, the, the rule is, don't put your bars down just because I tell you to. And uh, the rule is if the lower you run your bars, the more challenging terrain you can navigate safely. And if you don't believe that, try it. If you're the guy that's not ready to advance into that technical terrain, uh, you're not gonna like low bars. But when you get in a situation uh, that's really technical, as soon as you drop your bars, it's going to uh, help you a lot. And I've proven this over and over. Uh, you probably all know that I used to ride Arctic Cat. Arctic Cat has an adjustable height handlebar option. I think they still do, they used to. And um, so when I did a clinic, um, the Arctic Cat guys always came with their bars all the way up, because it was easy. Or to adjust, so they're always all the way up. And I, I was working with this one guy, and I kept telling him, "Drop your bars, drop your bars." And, and I put them down for him, and he'd ride it, and he'd put them back up. And we, I found him stuck in this um, really ugly place, and I went and helped him. I assisted him. I got him out, and in the course of uh, freeing his sled. I shoved his bars down without him picking up on that, okay? And I told him, look, make your line and drive it out. So he did, he was successful. And I met him at the bottom and I said, how's that work for you? He said, I can't believe I did it. I don't know what was different. It worked. I said, where are your handlebars? And he was dumped down. It worked. And, and that made him a believer in it. So I'm not telling you that you gotta run your bars low. I'm telling you that you need to run them low if you're gonna be running in technical backcountry terrain. The lower you run them, the easier it'll be for you. If you're six foot five, you don't want to run as low bars as I run. Um, I'll just add to that, the, the industry trend because of consumer demand has been higher is better. Higher is better. All the manufacturers have been putting high bars on until the last two years. And then Skidoo started building sleds with lower bars. So the, the new summits last year came with an inch lower bars than they have been. This, the expert comes with an inch lower bars than the standard sled. So it's on a downward trend. It's easy to change. If you're six foot five, that's too low, put an extension on it. Make it work for you. Uh, this sled is an expert. It's mine. It's got an inch lower riser, and it's got a zero rise bar. The factory bar is a one inch rise, 
So effectively, my grips are two inches lower than factory. So it's pretty low, considering considering the summit's two inches higher than the expert, and two inches lower for the four inch difference. Flatline goggles. What would I suggest for flatline? Great question, and a lot of writers will have a different response to this than I'll have. Um, but I feel like the raspberry wine colored lens works the best in flat light. That's what I prefer. I always choose that color of lens. And it works on a sunny day as well. Maybe not as better, as good as another color, but in flat light it works. And it works in all conditions as far as I'm concerned. That's my favorite color. Uh, you know what? Sprint, uh, hand light is sprinkle back. <laughs> <laughs> the question is yeah. um, cardio. What kind of training? Uh, I'm really old school. I'm not the right guy to answer that question. I know there's athletes that go to the gym regularly to keep in shape, and I don't do that. I work a farm all summer. I stay pretty good physical shape. Physical shape that way. And I ride every day in the winter, so I don't have to go train in between. So, sorry, I can't help you with that so much. Thanks, guys. Uh, I, I had, it was my pleasure to uh, help you with some of this. I hope it was uh, not only entertaining, but uh, informational. And I'd like to see you on the mountain. Come see us in West, West Yellowstone, Montana. Our website is ryanrasmussenstyle.com. And tune in with our, at our uh, YouTube channel, Ryan Rasmussenstyle. Have a great winter, guys.